Hello and welcome to a very exciting um, new show for the Progressive Channel. Each and every week we're going to be discussing the news, the markets and the regulation as they affect property investors just like you. Today I'm joined by Mark Homer who's the founder and director of the Progressive Group and a property developer. Zoe Back who's the founder and director of Zest Financial, a independent mortgage broker and Kevin Paneskis, the founder of Property Soldier and an expert in serviced accommodation as well as a trainer and investor himself. So we've got a few stories to get through today. Our first story is a story on the rate of house completions falling through is decreasing. This is a story from Property Wire. Mark, do you want to kick us off on what you think of this story? Do you think it's legitimate? Do you think, um, you know, how do you think that's going to affect things? Okay, so the premise of this story is that um, transaction volumes are decreasing, probably because of uncertainty around Brexit and, uh, I don't know, less, perhaps less people coming over, um, all linked to the same thing. And therefore, the people that do agree to purchase are more committed um, than uh, would un ordinarily be the case. I'm not sure that's necessarily what I'm seeing in the marketplace, I don't always believe what's in the media. Uh, and often, as, as Kevin mentioned earlier on, the, the people that are writing these stories, um, they don't mm. have sort of granular knowledge of, of what's actually happening. Um, so, okay, maybe there's been a bit of a shift. Um, I, I'm, I couldn't say I, I've necessarily noticed that. Um, Zoe will update us yeah. a bit more on um, sort of surveyors and banks and whether they're causing more sales to fall through. I suspect maybe they are. Um, yeah, on, so yeah, yeah. on to, on to, so, on to so you, Zoe. Really. You know, you're very much in the trenches when it comes to property. You know, this article indicates that it's due to people being more committed and you know, um, mm. sure of their property uh, purchases when they go through. Do you think that holds true? Do you think that's, that's realistic from what you see? Um, I think if people are actually looking at purchasing a property, they've made that commitment and then they actually want to go ahead with it. What I'm finding as a mortgage broker is that we tend to have hurdles along the way once the application's gone in. So it might be that the property's valued at less than what it's been marketed for and the um, agreed price has been. So sometimes that can be a bit of an issue, so we have to go back to the vendor and try and change prices on that to get that reduced down to match the valuer's yeah. comments. Um, otherwise, it can we can have issues um, regarding the property itself. Maybe it needs some works to it. Maybe yeah. it's not quite up to scratch. So again, the valuers are kind of downvaluing on that basis. Um, and one of the main things I'm seeing is regarding the EPC, um, because with the EPCs, it has to be in a certain condition if it's going to be lettable. E. E. e yes. Or and unfortunately, I've had a few which have been an F. So really? then that's been an instant decline by the lenders. And that's going to become D by 2025, and it's going to become mm -hmm. C by 2030. Well, it's going to make my that. job a little bit harder then. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, do you think it's more that less that people are more committed, but more actually from the, the vendor side, houses are like more ready to be sold? There's less hurdles on that side, would you say? Or that like they're less likely to be in the way? Um, I think obviously the vendors are trying to move forward in what yeah. they want to do, so there's more movement for negotiations there as well if they've got a property yeah. that they want to move forward with. Um, and obviously buyers, from the ones that I see, they are committed to buying properties, but if the property is not right when the valuation is done, then they're quite happy to say, actually, there are others in the marketplace that we can go for. Kevin, what do you think about this story? I think inevitably uh, Brexit is, is going to be playing its part and so I think it's likely that people that are committed to selling and people that are committed to buying want to get that done before Brexit takes place. But as, as Mark alluded to earlier, um, a lot of what gets written in the press doesn't necessarily hold an awful lot of water in the real world of course, yeah. and it's, it's, it, would, it will be regionally specific in terms of the what is going on in, in the marketplace. Yeah. And I think for most people, they're not actually going to be seeing much uh, difference in, in terms of what generally goes on in the property market. So do you think this is like a general trend that you know someone has tried to kind of pin a correlation on, to causation, correlation yeah. kind of thing that you know isn't necessarily reflective of what's actually going on? I don't think any of us are actually noticing much, much of a difference yeah. to, to the, the status quo. Okay, cool. It's perhaps an advertorial 
platform, <laughs> of which there are a lot in the press. Of course, People yeah. like to comment on things that aren't necessarily <laughs> happening to get their name into the media. Cool. All right. Um, so our second story today is a story from the BBC that um, house prices have ground to a halt with only 0.2% growth in September. Um, Kevin, why do you think you know that might be the case? Obviously, we've got big factors that have been mm. kicking around for a long time, like you know, Brexit, you know, economic uncertainty. Um, do you think that affects investors at all? You know, is that a good thing or bad thing for investors? Yeah, I, I mean, unfortunately, none, none of us want to keep hearing that word um, Brexit, but it is going to be having an effect. But I think what most people just need to understand or, or remember is, is the cycles. The cycles will always take place in, in the property um, values yeah. and property prices. And ultimately, in, over time, they will always go up. And if they stall for a period of time, then then so be it. Um, I know one of one of Mark's uh, favourite phrases is don't wait to buy property, buy property and wait. And so I think we can be, we can overanalyze um, things and analysis paralysis definitely takes place. And, and that might well be what's causing the current uh, stall. But again, not in all parts of the country. So it, it's regionally specific. And so people actually don't, shouldn't be looking at the, the national data. They should be looking at the data in their own area and maybe speaking to people like Zoe, yeah. who would be able to give them a much better informed opinion on, on where, where their current market is in their region. Thank you. Um, so, sorry, would you say um, you've seen any impact on the number of, you know, like investment products you're putting through on, you know, on this long kind of slow grinding down of the, the valuations or is it not affected your, you know, your business, the number of investors you see come through at all? Um, at the moment, I would say my business is the busiest it's ever been. Um, I don't see any kind of slowdown whatsoever, but that might just be because I'm a specialist in my area um, and I cover the whole of the country. So I'm not in a specific area, so I'm not in Peterborough, I'm not in London, I cover everywhere. So for me, um, investors that I have are still looking to invest. Um, granted, a lot of them are going further north because the prices seem to be a lot better and the rental yields are a lot better as well. Um, but otherwise, I, I haven't seen a slowdown at all. Do you think this is going to, um, you know, remain until we get the, you know, a resolution on, on Brexit, this kind of economic paralysis that we're in? Do you think it's going to stay that way? Do you think we've got any end in sight for it? Um, obviously, I think everybody wants a resolution one way or another. But from a business point of view, for, for myself, um, you know, people are still going to need to buy houses. People still need somewhere to live. Um, if you've already got existing portfolio or properties, mm. then you need to remortgage those. So remortgage this year is immense for me because lots of lenders are putting up their standard mm. variable rates. So it's a lot cheaper for people to take out another fixed rate product. Okay, that's good. Mark, what, what do you think about this? Well, I think that the property market in this country operates a little bit like a roller coaster. Um, and if you think of the the start of this last cycle for me that was 2010 as we came out post recession um you know i would say i don't know end of 09 the first place to start growing would be mayfair yeah and then it goes out a little bit and you know maybe then it ends up in croydon and and then you you, you get sort of peterborough i don't know a little bit later on uh, and then it then it goes to the midlands and and sort of i don't know scotland wales uh, out of Hebrides 10 years later. Um, and it, it, what, what you find is, um, straight out of the traps, you know, th this huge growth in it, it, right in that epicentre in, in London. Um, and, and that happened last time. I think some of the sort of prime areas of London probably went up about two and a half times the price that they were in the, in the in right at the, the, the depths of the recession, maybe sort of early part of 09. So they had huge growth. Clearly Brexit came along uh, or, or the perception of you know, what Brexit was going to look like because Brexit hasn't actually happened yet. Um, less, less, less banks, less sort of um, employees for the banks in London and less people coming over um, meant that there were perhaps less demand for those properties. Yes, stamp duty went up as well, but anything below a million pounds, stamp duty didn't really go up or it, it went down in many cases. So. What, what happened was towards the end or, or, or you know, as the cycle developed, those areas um, have been sort of more affected, uh, probably come back because they, they went so far. But 
the rest of the country, um, especially the Midlands and, and especially the North, Scotland and, and, and Wales, they're further down on this roller coaster. So imagine Mayfair's right at the top here, right at the front of the roller coaster. And let's say right back here, you've got, I don't know, Partick just outside of Glasgow in Scotland. You know, Mayfair goes right over the top and then this, this, the roller coaster's still going up in the rest of the country. So, you know, this spreads across the country. Um, price rises happen, you know, in, 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 around London first. And then all of that ripples out because property continues to look relatively cheap. Uh, you know, in comparison to those more centralised areas. So I think you are seeing quite a bit of that, um, you know, the house price growth, the catch up, the ripple continue. Uh, and clearly as we go into, I don't know, maybe there'll be a bit of a blip and maybe when we go into the next cycle, you'll see areas of London, people will say, oh, London always goes up a lot more than the Midlands, the North and Wales and all that sort of stuff. Yes, it does earlier on in the cycle, but later on in the cycle, the other areas catch up. And generally, they remain roughly relative to each other, uh, but they just go up and down mm -hmm. at, at different points. Cool, thank you. Um, <coughs> so in this article, there's an indication that, you know, part of the reason for this might not be that there is a lack of demand, but there's a, a lack of new houses entering the market. Um, you know, so there's just less, less stock available, which is keeping growth low. Um, so do you... Have you seen an experience of people holding on to their homes, hoping that house prices are going to go back up? And there's a you know big swath of people kind of waiting for the house price to go back up before they sell. Do you think that that holds any water at all? Um, I haven't seen that myself. What I tend to find is that if people can't necessarily afford to move, then all they're doing is doing extensions to their existing mm -hmm. properties mm -hmm. just to make them bigger. Um, but Otherwise, you know, people are still very confident in the marketplace and if they can afford to move, then they are. And prices at the moment, if you're looking at interest rates, they're still very low. Yeah. So even at a 90% mortgage, the interest rates are so low, amazing time to buy. Kevin, what do you think of that? It's, uh, I think it's just simple um, market forces in, in play when, when they are not building enough house, houses to um, meet the, the demand. Um, I think it was the Barker report, um, you know, 10 years ago, or something like that, said that we needed to be building 250,000 mm. houses a year, and we, we've never met that. And we, we, let's face it, we're unlikely to meet that. And so therefore, when there's more demand for something, the price of that thing goes up. And, and, and is, there's no difference with property. And, and as a property investor, that, that's a good thing. And so it, it's the safest place that I know to invest mm. my money because I know there's always going to be demand and the demand for it continues to grow. And, um, and that's why rents will always go up over time and that's why house prices will always go up over time and that it will always be inflation. And so don't have your money in the bank mm -hmm. getting you know, decreased in value but because of inflation, put it into property because it's a safe place to invest. Mark, do you think there's any truth in that? Do you think there's big groups of people holding on to their houses waiting for Brexit to happen so that house prices will go back up? Or do you think that's, you know, not got any truth to it? Uh, well, I think there are some people uh, definitely that are sitting on the sidelines. If you think of um, international investors, um, I, I think certainly Asia and maybe quite a few of the Europeans um, are waiting for Brexit to happen because they see it as quite a big thing. Um, and they have the choice whether to be in this market or not, whereas a homeowner is already in this market. So, and if they need to move for, I don't know, work or kids or, or whatever, they, they, they're sort of forced down that road. So I think when Brexit gets finally settled, and who knows when that will be, I suspect there's going to be a load of this money go straight into the market. Um, sterling is very weak. Um, the weakest it's been against the dollar, um, and the euro, even though that wasn't in existence um, when I was really young, but um, the, in my whole lifetime. So, you know, I, I suspect um, that will make it, that makes it doubly attractive, somewhere like London, especially to, to, to foreigners. Um, so I think they'll come back. Um, I think there are inevitably some people in this country who would prefer to wait for Brexit, especially if they're making a big purchase mm -hmm. and they're upgrading, they're going up the ladder. Um, maybe they feel a little bit less certain about their job or if they feel like house prices are going to drop a lot maybe they're, they're holding back hence why transaction volumes have reduced yeah. a bit um, but you know this this whole sort of supply demand um, 
um, you know, it, 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 it's still not at equilibrium. Um, there is a lack of supply in the marketplace um, because um, Barker Report 03, and then you've got subsequently, I think, another report which was in the last sort of two, three years, which which, which just says, uh, similar to what Kevin said, we, we need over 200,000, maybe that's 250, something like that. I think this year we got, it, it's been the highest it's been for. 10 years in terms of the number of completions, uh, but it still hasn't got to the level necessary to meet the demand. Uh, and that's happened for all of the last 10 years, so we're playing catch up. Um, so with that lack of supply and the affordability is quite a big thing that, 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 that Zoe's been talking about. Um, clearly, if interest rates are low, you know, house prices can go up quite a bit and people can still afford the monthly payments. Um, j just because the, the money's so cheap. So there's probably still some wriggle room in there. And the other thing is, even though people have been moaning about Brexit and you know growth has maybe been subdued since 2016, um, it's pretty obvious that there has been wage growth, probably two, three percent, something like that, every year since 16. Um, so you could say that wages are 10 percent more than they were in 2016. So that should support, um, you know, some house price increases and increased demand. Um, and there's been some inflation as well. Um, inflation's all right. It's it's not maybe running at two percent like it should be, um, but it but it's there. So uh, I think all of this sort of adds up to you know a reasonably firm markets, especially outside of London. I don't think you know certainly in our area things haven't really dropped. I think in the north they're still going up um, in, in terms of sort of capital values and, and that looks like it will continue but I think London will see a big increase when um, when this gets settled in terms of um, international demand um, people will get excited uh, for, uh, especially for the stuff under a million pounds because once you get over one and a half million stamp duty just gets crazy so unless that gets fixed um, I don't know, maybe that will remain being sort of a little bit more subdued. Um, but the stuff at the sort of lower end uh, around the M25, I suspect, is, is due a big jump. Cool. Thank you. Um, so for anyone watching, um, we all of the links to these stories are going to be in the description of the video. Um, our third story today is um, John Lewis is seeking discounts from some of its landlords because um, it's struggling as a retailer. Obviously, there's echoes of what happened with BHS. Uh, where they made a big move to try and get you know big discounts from their landlords, um, you know obviously there's been lots of movement in the last few years of you know retailers exiting high streets and the laws around con converting those into property has been you know residential has been really good for investors. Um, Kevin, what do you think about this? Do you think this is any indication on you know the strength of the the high street and retailers in general? Obviously, John Lewis, like Thomas Cook, that recently went under, is a very old and established retailer. Um, you know what, what do you think about this? Um, I, th I think it's inevitable that um, the, the, the way people spend money um, and with e-commerce um, taking place and um, people buying online, etc., it, it's going to cause um, buying habits to change. It is, has caused buying habits to change. And therefore, the high street is becoming a thing of the past. It's not cost effective to be selling your product on the high street. And, uh, you know, Thomas Cook is, is an example of that. An awful lot of companies, we see money being ploughed into them to keep them afloat, and it's, it's like trying to stop the tide coming in. It, it is futile. And they're trying to compete with people that have a fraction of their staff and a fraction of their overhead because most of their products mm. are being sold online. Now, what, what does that mean to us property investors? It, it means good things because an awful lot of this real estate and, and Mark is taking advantage of this, um, and progressive property are taking advantage of this significantly. And it can be acquired because the demand for that thing has gone down, so therefore it can be acquired at a much better price and then converted into something where there is demand, residential property. Um, and that, that's an area that I think we should all be looking at as property investors significantly, is to be moving into this space that's being vacated by retail on the high street. And the councils that are trying to plough money into it to keep this afloat, again, they're, in, in my opinion, wasting public money to do that. We should all just not try and stop the tide coming in and just move with the times. Do you think it's um, obviously both BHS, John Lewis, are department stores, you know, they have 
lots and lots of you know square footage they have a huge amount of products do you think this is something specific to that kind of store that is not relevant anymore or, or do you think this is something that's going to filter down even to you know boutique and unique stores that cover only one thing or is that the future of the high street these very boutique kind of stores well clearly that they don't need the huge real estate that they once required mm. they don't need that anymore and so you, you've got more and more redundant space but the the for instance with, with john lewis trying to negotiate with the landlords cheaper rent an awful lot of these companies are trying to do that in order to stay afloat mm. and again trying to stop the tide coming in um and so yes inevitably they they will they will try and to change their model try and change try and change but in in the end there's going to be very few um uh, more and more online um, uh, comma, mm. e-commerce taking place than there is the high street and, and us property investors should be able to move into that space. Um, there's, there's clearly challenges with some of this, this larger um, space being used as residential because, you know, um, Mark's a better person to speak about it than me because to convert that into residential has its issues with regards to having um, daylight and um, ventilation and all of those things that need to happen. So, you know, I'll, I'll defer to Mark mm. on, on that side, but um, I, I do think we all need to be looking seriously at getting into to buying these mm. properties that are becoming vacant. Mark, what do you think about this and John Lewis? Okay, so um, John Lewis uh, come, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe uh, towards the back of a long line of other retailers that have um, maybe taken an even more aggressive approach um, than they are, and, and it's probably conversant with their their sort of brand and you know the John Lewis I mean it looks in here like they're asking landlords to consider a rent reduction or, or service charge reduction um, you know if you look at Sports Direct um, or you look at um, as well specifically Debenhams or you know House of Fraser or especially Arcadia they're going through CVAs so these CVAs are a legal process which forces the landlord uh, well, it's a legal process that effectively it's an insolvency of those groups that, that then puts a lot more pressure on the landlords um, to reduce their rents because if they don't, then they're going to end up with a vacant unit. Uh, clearly, when these businesses go through a CVA, um, these sort of long leases, maybe they've signed up for 20 years with upward only rent increases, clearly that um, you know, sort of legal covenant is broken. Uh, and they don't have to honour it anymore. So the leverage is then on the side of the, the, the retailer. Um, so I don't know how successful John Lewis will be to get you know, a landlord who is in a 20 year lease with them uh, to reduce their rent, because why would they do it? I wouldn't do it. Um, is John Lewis gonna go through a CBA? Well, I, I expect they're probably not in that bad financial shape and there are lots of other consequences in doing that, you know, in terms of their other creditors and, you know, all of their, um, you know, all their facilities with banks and, uh, and suppliers and everything like that. So um, I'm sure it's true. Uh, rents in, uh, you know, big spaces like that, you know, if you're, if you're thinking, I don't know, in the middle of Peterborough, um, it wouldn't surprise me if John Lewis was working off a floor plate of 40,000 square foot, which is absolutely gargantuan. And then they're, they're over sort of four or five floors. It's not relevant, as Kevin was saying. Um, lots of retailers now uh, take the orders in smaller stores. Maybe they're more boutique. Maybe they're more of an experience. And then the, the, the items get shipped um, straight from the... Um, sort of distribution centre to, to the home. So um, the, 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 the rates on those buildings are, are clearly, they're about half the rent in areas like, like this. Um, so it's, it's, it's not been sustainable for most, most of these, these retailers and, and that's got to change. So I, 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 yes, maybe I would have thought as the leases come to an end, John Lewis are going to have good leverage uh, and they're going to be able to, to get some rent reductions. But as Kevin said, there's a limit uh, because as they, they, they hit the capital value of these buildings by accepting lower rents, at some point the, um, the attractiveness of converting those buildings into other uses such as residential or offices, which let's face it, a lot of offices have been removed from the marketplace and converted into residential, so there are not that many left. Uh, and certainly where we are, uh, offices in the town centre are, you know, the, the values are increasing. Uh, along with the rents. 
So there are other use classes which become more attractive. And you may see, you know, it get to the point where retail space is, is reduced so much that the, 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 the rents will then firm. But clearly there's still an oversupply in the market. So I suspect there's still an opportunity there. Um, we've bought a few retail buildings, um, reduced the size of them, kept the ground floor, uh, and then put residential above. Um, for which there is good demand uh, and, it, and it can work really well. What I tend to find is when, when there's a news report about retail being really bad or, or should I say consecutive news reports and everyone gets very down about a sector like they are about retail, that often offers an opportunity. Mm -hmm. You can get the buildings for the right money and, and then do something else with it. Conversely, if you look at industrial, um, you know, the, the media and the general feeling is, oh, it's, a, you know, really, really good, you know, small storage and distribution units, m you know, maybe there's a trade counter or, or, or whatever. Lots of online businesses use those. Um, yeah, true, I, you know, there are a lot less voids and there are tenants for those sorts of buildings, but equally, the capital values of those buildings has increased a lot. Uh, is that what you want to be getting into right now? I'm not sure. Do you think there's um, an element to this, uh, you know, of kind of, you know, creating the the image of the evil landlord, you know, it's like almost a landlord's responsibility to cut their prices to keep these businesses afloat. Um, you know, like it's on you if these properties, these businesses go under, you know, do you think there's an element of that? Often the, you know, the uh, landlord gets a really beating in, you know, the media for being, you know, bad. Yeah. And do you think there's an element of this, you know, like a PR element of like, you know, it's John, if John Lewis's business model isn't working, it's not the responsibility of landlords to to fill that gap in their, um, you know, balance books. You know, do you think there's an element of that? You know, we've seen that before as well. I think the retailers would like to sell that message to the media. Um, and yes, there is a little bit of support for that. Um, you know, you, you saw with, uh, let's say, Sports Direct mm. and... Um, I think how House of Fraser stroked Debenhams, you, you could see Mike Ashley trying to use that argument, mm -hmm. saying, oh, there's going to be all these redundancies, NS the landlords start yeah. to behave. Um, I think in terms of the reception from the public, um, yeah, there's a bit of support for that, but I think there's a lot less support uh, and interest in that argument from the public than there is when you're talking about residential property yeah. and residential landlords, because... I suspect residential landlords are more the boogeyman to the public mm -hmm. than a commercial landlord who's dealing with, you know, a commercially savvy business, let's hope, um, th that should be able to look after itself. Um, but, um, yeah, I, uh, landlords get a, a, a bad press. Mm. Um, you know, but w what about the fact that the landlord may have bought that building on the basis that that tenant was in there? They, they bought it off a 5% or 4% yield because mm. there was a 20-year lease on it. Um, they've spent their pension on it. It's actually the general public um, that own it because, you know, it, it's a fund that owns it, you know, mm -hmm. with people's pensions in it. And, you know, that fund's going to suffer a big capital loss because um, the building is worth that much less because the, the, the rent is reduced. Mm. Um, is that fair? No. Um, so, you know, it's... Um, it's not always something that the media want to talk about. No, but, of um, and, and certainly the retailers don't want to talk about that, but um, it's relevant. So have you got anything to add on this? Do you see any impact with you know, the work you do on you know, commercial to residential? Um, so from my side of things, obviously I deal mainly with residential, um, but what I have noticed is that there's a lot more commercial buildings that were used for offices, etc., that are being converted into residential. So lots of different flats, for instance, that are coming around, especially in Peterborough, there's quite a few different developments that are going on. Um, so for me, that's good because obviously I can help people get on the ladder and get a property for themselves. Um, but it's also good for the towns as well because what you don't want is empty properties. And obviously at the moment, what we are seeing on the high street is that a lot of the shops and businesses are going out of business yep. for whatever reason, could be high rates, could be other economic factors. Um, but that space needs to be used for something. You don't want to have empty properties. So if we can get the permissions to be able to convert it mm. into residential, makes perfect sense. Do you think there'll be a um, you know, further loosening of those regulations you know, for um, commercial to residential that we've seen in the last few years? Mark? 
Um, well, there are more permitted development rights in the pipeline. So um, they were talking last week uh, about adding on or, or allowing um, freeholders to add two floors of residential onto existing residential blocks, I think, subject to prior notification and various other things. Um, I think it will be a lot easier to do that if the buildings around the building in question are higher. I haven't seen the detail because I don't think they've decided upon the detail and they certainly haven't released it. Um, so I think that's coming. Um, I think most of the other permitted development rights around offices, storage and distribution, um, cinema, sorry, um, amusement arcades and betting shops, um, there, there, there are permitted development rights to convert those into residential. Uh, that exists currently. The agricultural buildings are there. I went and looked at agricultural building a couple of nights ago. A farmer pal of mine, who um, <laughs> he's found a, he's found an old tin shed, um, <laughs> and we were out shooting, and he, he just said, "What can I do with that?" I said, "I think you can turn it into a house." So <laughs> <laughs> I've been and had a look, and um, I've got my planning consultant on it. I suspect he may he may be able to do that one. So that's been around a little while. Um, yeah, um, but I think the offices, yeah, a lot. A hell of a lot of being done. Clearly, Labour want to ban all this and re remove these permitted development rights, especially on offices. Um, who knows whether they'll get anywhere near government? <laughs> Kevin, obviously, you do a lot with service accommodation, a lot of which is city centre based. Um, have you seen any impact on this? Is, it, is much of your stock made up of previously commercial properties, or have you got more in the pipeline? You know, is this impactful to you at all? Um, yeah, good question. I, I think as, a, as property investors, we should always pick the point of least resistance. And um, with, with service accommodation, forward slash furnished holiday let, because um, what most people are actually doing in this sector is, mm. is furnished holiday let, not service accommodation. So just to be clear for, for, the, for some people, yeah. as far as HMRC is concerned, service accommodation is um, guest houses, B&Bs, hotels, etc. And... Um, Service accommodation in terms of furnished holiday let is, is exactly that. It's furnished holiday let. And so existing houses um, are a lot easier to use as furnished holiday mm -hmm. let, or you can, you can buy existing property um, and use that as furnished holiday let. And what I'm talking about there is C3, residential property, um, where it's for somebody's um, primary or, or secondary use. So it doesn't have to be your principal prime residence, etc. And so what we are doing is we are... We are converting existing buy-to-lets into service accommodation and we are purchasing property to use as service accommodation forward slash furnished holiday let because there is more and more demand for it. Um, when you, you know, something, I think we can just strip this back and make something really, make it all really, really easy and that is that something is worth um, what people are willing to pay. And you just have to forward think this and just currently always be thinking, where can I meet demand? And so where I see the demand is that people want to be saving money on hotels. And when they're going on to booking.com, yes, they will see the price of hotels. And then they will also see your listing, your furnished holiday let listed on booking.com. And that offers a, you know, a cheaper um, net result for them, especially with larger groups of people that might be multiple hotel rooms um, or your one three bedroom property that they can stay in your property for one week, two weeks, three, three weeks and six months. And that, that represents an awful lot more income for the property investor than if they were letting that out as buy to let or HMO. In my experience, because I've been doing buy to let and HMO for, for 28 years and service accommodation for the, about the last four, because another actor, another thing going on, and Mark alluded to it, is, is government interfering. And what they have done is, is making it harder for buy to let and HMO in terms of Section 24 and removing the mortgage interest rate relief. And actually with um, service combination or with furnished holiday let, once you qualify under the furnished holiday let rules, then you can still offset your mortgage interest against your income. And so it actually becomes much more tax efficient to do that. Will that always be the case? We don't know. And if the government interfere again and they, they make it necessary for me to change my model, then I'll do it. And I would always just be reactive. And I'll always just try and sweat the asset as much as possible. And if buy to let becomes better in the future, I'll do buy to let. And if HMO becomes better in the future, I'll focus on that. At the moment, I'm quite enjoying the service accommodation space. 
Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Um, so our last topic to talk about today is a right move article about um, the rent hotspots um, outside of London. So um, what it says here, so you know, some places, Pudsey in West Yorkshire, for example, has had a 12% jump in rental in the last uh, 12 months. And most of the uh, growth in rental is in the north of England outside of um, London. So, so obviously you deal all across the country. Um, have you seen uh, any impact from this at all? Does this hold true with, you know, the amount of uh, you know buy to let and, and commercial stuff you're having done in the north yes potentially i have the sole effect of changing that up north <laughs> and that would be because lots of investors are going to the north to buy properties okay and basically what they're doing is they're buying rundown properties which is why we've had issues with epc being f um, and then they're doing them up making them nice for people for the local area. A lot of the local areas are having investments from mm -hmm. the government and other parties, um, which are just making the areas a lot more nicer for people to live in. So hand in hand, if you're having lots of investors going to a particular area that are then buying up all the properties and refurbishing them, that is going to make the rents increase. Cool. Mark, what do you think about um, this story? Um, I think it's back to the old roller coaster that I mentioned <laughs> earlier on. Um, um, I, you know, we saw a lot of these sorts of rent increases probably a couple of years ago. You know, maybe three years ago, we saw three beds go from about five fifty to about seven seven fifty in the space of a year, eighteen months around here on the on the low end sort of ex council ones, which I look at, um, you know, frequently and and on a granular level so um I, I think that has spread i think it's it's sort of gone up north and, it, and it's going to the regions now I, I think that's the first thing i think the next thing is what kevin was talking about that all these sort of attacks on landlords so um you know the fact you can't offset all the mortgage interest against the rent if you own personally you can sell in a, in a limited company um the fact that there's a three percent surcharge on stamp duty um, if you purchase a property for buy to let. Um, the um, potential um, abolition of the Section 21, which will make it a little bit more complicated to evict tenants. Um, all of those things create negative media stories. Uh, and I think less landlords have been buying off the back of that and some have been selling. And that will create a situation where rents go up inevitably because there's less supply. Uh, and that was what we saw around here, and I just think it's playing out across the rest of the country. Uh, and I think there's, uh, y you know, there's more runway there. I think that's going to continue. Um, people are going to, yes, landlords are buying, but in a, in in net terms, uh, there are more first-time buyers now, um, and I just suspect there's going to be less supply of rental property uh, in the in the sort of medium term so therefore rents inevitably will increase um it's just a back, back to that sort of <laughs> supply demand mm. uh, coefficient um kevin so obviously you know in this story we've seen some places rent has increased by 12 percent eight percent ten percent but then we're seeing that house prices are only increasing by 0.2 percent obviously that can be a huge boon if you're investing in the right place what do you think that says about the balance between you know, uh, purchase properties and rental properties, you know, that there's such a difference in the growth. It, it's, it all comes down to when there's more demand for something, the price of that thing goes up. But I, again, getting back to what I said earlier, people look, need to just focus on their own region, their own area. Mm -hmm. And if you can spot something that's going to happen in the future, then you can be ahead of this curve that Mark's alluded to. And so I'll give you some examples. In, in South Wales, um, Newport has seen a significant increase in, in rents and uh, property values. Uh, why? Because the Seven Bridge toll came down, which means that people can now commute into Bristol, which is a major hub, an awful lot cheaper. It's a significant saving for people to now buy or rent in Newport um, if they are, want to live or do live and work, or, sorry, if they're working in, in Bristol. And so we've seen that coming for years, and yet people all of a sudden are thinking, oh, oh now I need to be buying in, in Newport. And so they, they should have done it a year or two ago before the toll was removed. And whenever you see something like, um, you know, HS2 as an example, 
if it's something that's going to create faster commuting into London, for instance, then you should be looking ahead uh, and, and looking to be acquiring property ahead of, ahead yeah. of that happening, if HS2 does in fact happen. But what then therefore happens is the demand um, goes up for rental and then the rental prices go up. And, but if you've acquired it cheap, Mm -hmm. then you can uh, take advantage of that. The rental, rental goes up and then the value of your property goes up and then you can refinance. Mm -hmm. And as long as you are, you are buying something that's got a good yield, um, then, then you're always going to be able to sweat that asset some more. People make the mistake of, of buying something too expensive and then expecting the yield to be good. And that's why, for instance, buy to let doesn't really work as well in London as it would do in South Wales or, or up north. But as long as you're predicting the trends and predicting what's going on, and buying where there is demand, then you are going to be successful no matter what happens in the marketplace. So you've made the um, distinction a couple of times between like national and regional, and you see these articles all the time, you know, the best places to invest, where's growing the most. You know, to, to investors, would you recommend, you know, like focus on an area and, you know, you know, stay with it and understand the ups and downs rather than chasing the money around the country? You know, what, you know because, this implies, you know, that the best thing to do would be like just buy all over the country, wherever is growing. Um, you know, what about what would you say is the best thing to do? Drop focus on one area, or or, or follow the money. One hundred percent focus on the area that you become an expert in, because people. Uh, I see this with people that buy from deal sources, deal packages, and mm -hmm. they end up with properties scattered all over the the country. Um, they are totally at the mercy of. <laughs> of forces outside of their control there and they do not understand the market um, in that area. So yes, I, my advice um, is to focus on one area. Now, ideally that area is near to where you live, but if not, then focus on an area where you can leverage other people you know, in situ and become an expert in that area. And the point is that there is a property investment strategy for everyone, no matter where you live. You know, in, in London, for instance, it could be buying and selling, it could be lease purchase options, it could be HMO, it could be service accommodation. I suppose less attractive in terms of yield would, would be buy to let, mm. um, but it all, all comes down to somebody's appetite as well in terms of what type of property investing yeah. suits them. So there's no right or wrong. But to answer your initial question, I think people should try and focus on a specific area and become an expert in that area and don't think that the grass is always greener on the other side. Mark, I know you're a big advocate of, you know, focusing on one area, you know, progressive, very heavily focus on Peterborough and, and regions very close to that. Um, is it hard when you see things like this and you see these big house prices not to like jump on the shiny penny and stick with what you know? Because it must be tempting as an investor when you see these big things, but I'll like, oh, jump on that, jump on that, you know, um, what do you think about that? Do you have that urge sometimes? Um, I used to, yeah, when I started. Um, I think it's a complete mugs game. Um, I think it's a favourite of the media uh, to, to find the next property hotspot. Well, it'll always um, get a lot of views when it does. an article it, like this. It does. It, it, gets, it gets loads of eyeballs on it. People go, ooh, Hartlepool's going up. Or, ooh, isn't Manchester the place to buy? But as Kevin said, that that happened a while ago. By the time it's made it to the article, <laughs> you're already too late. Absolutely, these guys are reporting history. Um, so you know, it, it, those transactions probably happened a year, six months ago, whatever. And then Land Registry's reported it, and then these guys have got onto it. But actually, the change happened a couple of years ago, um, and inevitably, by the time you read it, the next hotspot is already somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So it's a complete mugs game. Um, Kevin's right, you should absolutely find a good yielding area somewhere where there's good demand from tenants, become the expert in that area and then keep buying in that area. And, and you know, all the letting agents, all of the refurb teams, all of the you know, local surveys, you get to know them all. You get you an reduce your cost, scale, yeah, you, you'll yeah. know what streets to buy on, all that stuff. And inevitably, your area will become the hotspot. But then it won't be the hotspot, um, you know, and it, it'll you'll get it next time round. Uh, but trying to chase the next hotspot according to what the media says is a complete waste of time. Uh, I think also people, um, you, you know, they they'll sometimes they'll look at property investment in the same vein as buying I don't know equities mm -hmm. or you know oh well we can just switch from this to this. Um, you know, you could, you could buy a Lloyd share, you could sell it today, and then you can go and buy Tesco shares tomorrow. Um, 
and I just don't think property is like that. I think it's, you know, the transactions take a lot more time, it's a lot more illiquid, and it requires knowledge. It, it requires that you learn what you're doing, you, you, you get local contacts, um, and, you know, I think that's how you make money out of this, rather than sort of switching between areas or styles as mm. some equity investors may do. Um, actually, they're probably not well advised to do that because clearly, I don't know, someone like Warren Buffett would go extremely deep, understand an area very, very well, and that what, that's what makes him a great stock picker. Uh, but very, very few people mm. are able to replicate um, you know, his success or, or, or become a good stock picker. So um, I think pick a good area and focus on it and, and focus on the yield. You know, all this stuff we're talking about, capital values going up, rents going up, you cannot predict when that is going to happen. You can say in the long run, it, it, it is, you know, it's inevitable, um, but you don't know when it's going to happen and by how much. What you do know is if you've got a great yield or, or maybe you've got great sort of income from a, a serviced accommodation in a certain area, that is almost guaranteed as long as you run the unit properly uh, and you manage it well and you you know you, you look after your voids and maintenance and management all that sort of stuff um, so you, you're much better to focus on maximizing that income rather than trying to predict where the next area is that's going to see market outperforming capital growth and rental price increases lots of people don't do that uh, they love focusing on this stuff, but um, trying to predict it is a, is a mug's game. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Zoe, do you see this this with your investors, you know, the um, investors you work it with, do you see that they focus on, you know, specific areas and double down those, or do you work with people that have that scattergun approach? Um, I think what you tend to find is that when per people first get into property, they do the whole reading, they go, oh, this area is good, that mm -hmm. area is good, etc. So you tend to find that they've got a few all over the place to start with and then once they start getting into it full time and actually making a real conscious effort to focus just on property then they would focus more on one particular area and um, mortgage lenders actually prefer it if people are based in one area for their investment properties because they know that they've probably got the same management company that's going to be looking after it they know the area well it's less likely for them to have voids, so therefore the mortgage should always be paid on time. So for the mortgage company, when you're submitting applications and you're purchasing in the mm. same kind of area, then it's far more likely to be accepted. Oh, that's really interesting, yeah. Thank you, okay, um, that's everything for today. So um, Kevin, where can people find you if they wanna follow you and listen to what, more of what you've got to say? I'm known as the, the property soldier, uh, why? I, I was in the army for 24 years and I was investing <laughs> in property for most of that time and then left the army without the need to get to job. So I thought property soldier works. And um, my website, um, www.propertysoldier.co.uk. Awesome. Zoe, where can people find you? Um, my main point of contact really is either Facebook, so you'll find me at Zoe Back at Zest Financial, um, or obviously my website, which is zestfinancial.co.uk. Fantastic. And Mark, yourself? Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm on Facebook and Instagram, and um, if you go on the Progressive website, there'll be loads of contact details there. I think it's progressiveproperty.co.uk. Thank you. And neither Mark nor Kevin mentioned it, but they both have podcasts. You can find them on iTunes. You should have a listen. Um, thank you very much for watching, everyone. Um, if you enjoyed, please leave a comment. If you've got anything you want us to discuss, please comment below. Um, please like and subscribe to the channel as well, so you get notifications for these videos in the future. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.